Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, students, faculty, friends, um, welcome to our event today, a talk by Ambassador Gary Grappo entitled Five Uncomfortable Facts About the Middle East. We're proud to announce that Ambassador Grappo uh, recently joined our Center for Middle East Studies as a distinguished fellow. Uh, Ambassador Gary Grappo is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service of the U.S. State Department. Uh, the senior positions that he has held at the State Department include U.S. Ambassador to Oman, Charge d'Affaires, and Deputy of Mission to, uh, in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, Minister of Counselor for Political Affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, in which um, he served under our current Dean, Ambassador Christopher Hill, Director of Regional Affairs for the State Department's Near East Bureau in Washington, D.C. Um, um, Ambassador Grappo also served um, as envoy and head of mission of the Office of the Quartet Representative, um, working with Tony Blair in Jerusalem, covering both Israel, uh, the West Bank, and Gaza. <laughs> Ambassador Grappo is the CEO and founder of the Equilibrium International Consulting and a distinguished fellow at the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Denver's Joseph Corbell School of International Studies. And one reason why we are thrilled to have him affiliated with our center is because one of the goals that we have at the Center for Middle East Studies is to expand our programming, but also our course offerings on the Middle East. And so we're also very happy to announce that Ambassador Grappo in the fall quarter will be teaching um, uh, courses on the Middle East and U.S. foreign policy, drawing upon his um, um, lifetime of experience working in the Middle East as a U.S. diplomat. I think that's a, a unique set of um, experiences that he has accumulated um, during his time working at the U.S. State Department that he can, he can then pass on and share with aspiring students and those who are coming up behind him who also aspire to a career um, of service at the U.S. State Department. So with that as an introduction, uh, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Gary Grappo. Well, good afternoon, and thank you very much, uh, Nader. Um, when I was asked to uh, make this uh, presentation, I uh, gave some thought to the title that I would give my remarks, uh, and I quickly came up with the un uncomfortable facts, uh, when in uh, fact, um, they really are sort of profound and really very distressing realities of uh, the Middle East uh, today. Um, so I just want to prep you. Um, these are really difficult uh, and uh, have presented challenges to decades of diplomats and those living in the region. Um, if you're a Panthers fan, wallowing in the thrashing that you took last uh, Sunday, um, then this is the place you want to be as opposed to downtown with the, the celebrations. So over the past 60 or so years, uh, the Middle East has been struck with a multitude of crises, many requiring international and often American intervention. Let's just quickly summarize a few of these. The Suez Crisis of 1956, two major confrontations between Israel and the Arab powers, in 1967 and again in 1973, Iran's Islamic Revolution in 1979 and the seizing of the American diplomats, colleagues actually as hostages, the bloody and disastrous Iran-Iraq War from 1980 to 1988. That conflict took the, took the lives of over one million Iranians and Iraqis. Concurrently, there was a Lebanese civil war from 1975 to 1989, uh, 89, responsible for the deaths of some 175 Lebanese, 1,000. Iraq's 1990 invasion of Kuwait and the Gulf War that ensued between Iraq and the American-led coalition. And then two violent intifadas in the West Bank that set back Israeli-Palestinian peace negotiations and then multiple armed clashes between Israel and Hamas in Gaza uh, since 2009. Of course, the 9-11 Al-Qaeda-led terrorist attacks in the United States, followed by others in London, Madrid, Bali, Riyadh, and elsewhere. And the US-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. The bloody civil war that ensued and the loss of nearly 200,000 Iraqi lives and nearly 4,500 Americans. And then the Arab Spring, 2011. 
That precipitated the downfall of dictators in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, and Yemen, and touched off unrest and violence throughout the region. And it seems like the region quickly went from an Arab spring to an Arab winter. Now, I've not mentioned oil embargoes, tanker wars, the rise of extremism, the hundreds of lesser terrorist incidents, and the deaths of hundreds of American troops and diplomats in Nairobi, Dar es Salaam, Lebanon, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, and Benghazi at the hands of terrorists. And I haven't talked about the challenges and crises that currently plague the Middle East and dominate the headlines that we see, read every day. So in my comments today, I'm going to focus on, on some events and issues commanding the headlines today, but also on critical issues that are less often reported and therefore perhaps less well understood, but yet bear heavily on the immense problems of instability and unrest that we see in the region. Now, these are uncomfortable to us, and especially to the people of the region, because none pre presents easy solutions, not even moderately difficult solutions. In fact, as we look at them today, they seem almost insoluble. Now I'll offer a few of my own thoughts on how we might address these, but I'll be the first to admit that my ideas are, are as fraught with shortcomings and flaws as many of the others that you may read about. So I'm going to start with what I term the human condition in the Middle East. There was a series of comprehensive studies by the UN Development Program known as the Arab Human Development Report, and it paints a depressing picture of the Middle East today. It's a simmering crisis that touches the entire range of human endeavor. The first UNDP report back in 2002 identified three cardinal obstacles to human development in the Arab world. The widening deficit in freedom, women's rights, and knowledge. And subsequent reports pointed out the region's lack of human security or welfare. Now, the lack of human security does not impact just the more obvious threat to personal security, as acute as that is today in most parts of the region. It affects a broad range of areas bearing on human welfare. Consider these. Today, the Middle East is confronted with exploding urban growth. In 1970, 38% of the Arab world population resided in urban areas. By 2005, it had grown to 55%, and it will surpass 60% by 2020. And that's paired with a demographic time bomb. The region's youth bulge poses major human and security problems. Young people are the fastest growing segment in Arab countries' populations today. 60% of the population is under 25, with a median age of 22, and those ages are coming down every year. By the way, the global average today is 28. This region, of course, also faces scarce water resources. Only 43% of total available surface water originates within Arab countries. Most of that is in, within just three rivers. Underground water resources are being depleted faster than they can be Replenish. It's currently estimated there's a gap of about 20%. And 70% of the world's desalination plants are located in the Middle East. And that's coupled with rapid desertification. A UN Environment Program study estimates the desert has swallowed up more than two-thirds of the landmass of Arab countries. And not surprisingly, in the Arabian Peninsula, it's over 90%. So declining water resources and diminishing arable land mean greater dependency on imported food. Food imports as a percentage of total merchandise imports is the highest of any region in the world, ranging from 12 to 16 percent. That's double the average for the rest of the world. There is also stagnant economic growth. For the two and a half decades after 1980, the region witnessed hardly any economic growth. Real G GDP per capita in the Arab countries in that period 
grew by a total of 6.5%. That's a half a percent a year. Ranked against all the other countries in the world, would probably rank in the bottom 20. Yet the Arab population, which stood at 150 million in 1980, reached nearly 400 million last year. Arab countries were less industrialized in 2007 than they were four decades previously. Just one comparison. In 1950, Egypt and South Korea had nearly equal populations and GDP per capita only a few hundred dollars apart. Today, Egypt's population is 80% greater than South Korea's and its GDP per capita is less than one-seventh of South Korea's. So you won't be surprised to hear that unemployment is an enormous problem. Average overall unemployment rate for Arab countries is approaching 15% of the labor force. That's compared to less than six and a half for the rest of the world. In some countries, it approaches 25%. And youth unemployment is especially grave reaching almost 29% in 2014. And in some countries, it's as high as 45%. Finally, there's stunted knowledge dissemination. High rates of illiteracy among women persist, particularly in some of the less developed Arab countries. And fewer than 35% of women in the Arab world have at least some secondary education. Higher education is characterized by decreasing enrollment, reduced spending. Arab countries, by the way, spend less today on higher education than they spent in 1985. And they also have declining quality. Access to newspapers, media, and the internet is also constrained largely due to government policies, but also lack of resources. One especially tragic figure, in the 1,000 years since the end of the Abbasid Caliphate, which is known as the Golden Age of Islam. Fewer books have been translated into Arabic than are translated into Spanish in Spain in one year. Now, I've not mentioned health care, corruption, inefficient governing systems, or the growing threat of violence in the countries of the Arab world. These also are contributing to the mounting challenge of governance and ultimately raise profound questions about the future of the human condition in Arab countries today and in the future. So the obvious uncomfortable conclusion we can draw from these disheartening facts is uh, the region faces monumental challenges even beyond those we may read every day on the internet or in the newspapers. Institutions and systems for addressing them are simply not available, not in place yet. And the problems can't be adequately addressed until there's stability and a sense of security. And finally, while the international community can certainly help the region address its many challenges, the primary responsibility unquestionably lies with the people and the governments of the region. I now want to move into something very much related to uh, what I've just mentioned, and that's uh, the rise of sectarianism and extremism in the region. The hopeful days of early 2011, following the eruption of the Arab Spring, have sadly faded. And aspirations of democracy, freedom, justice, progress, and opportunity have been shattered by the grisly reality of sectarianism and extremism. And those have sparked incomprehensible levels of violence from the Atlantic coast of the Maghreb to the Euphrates. In Egypt, it was the secularist versus Islamists. In Syria, it's been the Shia-like Alawite government of al-Assad versus the many Sunni opponents, from the Free Syrian Army to Jabhat al-Nusra of al-Qaeda, and of course, the Islamic State. In Libya, where most of the population is Sunni, it's been various tribal factions and alliances vying for power. And in Yemen, the Shia Houthis confront their majority Sunni opponents. In Iraq, the Shia and Sunni feud seen and well documented from the time of the British intervention in the 1920s through the American invasion and occupation this last decade continues to the present day. 
Why is this happening? Events like the Arab Spring and what followed stem from the powerlessness, disenfranchisement, and hopelessness that many Arabs feel today. And I saw that in my 20 plus years that I lived and worked in that region. These feelings are magnified because their countries lack effective institutions and the ideologies necessary to animate them. I'm referring to governmental, civil, society, legal, and social, political, economic frameworks that would otherwise help them address their well-founded grievances. Instead, the institutions they have are ineffective, unrepresentative, oligarchical, or monarchical governments, the military intelligence establishment, those two are being pretty resoundingly rejected today, and then, of course, Islam and their family communities. As matters unraveled in the region and suitable institutions were unavailable, people have turned to what they have, Islam and their family or tribal connections. As explained by French analyst Olivier Broy, multiple ideologies have been key to the West's technical development, and the same can be said for our political and economic development. <coughs> but Islamists, and even many non-Islamists, in the region seek a political ideology based on Islam. For them, Islam is the only way to come to terms with the modern world and to confront their many challenges. So in the absence of viable ideological alternatives, opposition movements have broken down, not along, say, political philosophies or economic models, but rather along traditional religious or tribal ethnic lines, and sometimes, as in Yemen, both. It's all they have. In addition, instant information availability has accelerated the pace of change in this region as it has everywhere else in the world, placing enormous pressures on local, national, and international institutions. But in this region, institutions are either non-existent or in the nascent, nascent phases of their development. Organizations establish a more traditional lines, religion, and tribe are actually much stronger. But such organizations don't do very well when it comes to compromise and problem solving. In fact, they often deepen divisiveness. In the case of Syria, for example, we saw a noble and courageous movement begin in early 2011 by younger Syrians voicing their opposition to Assad and his regime and calling for change in the country. So groups formed, like those under the moderate Syrian National Coalition and subsequently moderate armed groups, like the Northern Free Syrian Army and the Southern Front, and then tribally-based groups. As government forces took more concerted action against the opposition and unity among the various groups began to fray, others formed along religious lines to carry the struggle against the regime and then against one another. Al-Qaeda appeared in the form of Jabhat al-Nusra, which itself later fractured into the group we know today as the Islamic State. Sectarianism has largely overtaken a conflict that was once originally intended to remove a despotic leader. Today, most of Syria's opposition lacks an overwhelming political philosophy that might guide Syria forward. And this unfortunate pattern is repeated the region. The great Arab historiographer Ibn Khaldun, who by the way was often quoted by Ronald Reagan, in his classic work, Ibn Khaldun, al muqaddimah called attention to this phenomenon in the Arab world. And he did it in the 14th century. With this in mind, we're left with this sad and unfortunate reality. The Middle East will be a region of upheaval, conflict, and violence for decades probably extending well into the middle of this century. Muslims the world over must confront the great challenge they face of sectarianism, particularly Shia versus Sunni. That solution lies with them alone. And generational change, more than one or two, will be necessary before culturally appropriate political ideologies and capable, responsive, and responsible institutions can take root in this region. 
I now want to turn to a conflict that's pretty familiar, I think, to most of us in this room. That's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's the region's most enduring and the most pernicious. It has precipitated all-out wars and long-simmering feuds. It's seen some promising highs, such as the Oslo Accords in 1993, and some depressing lows, the Second Intifada, which ran from 2000 to early 2005 and cost the lives of an estimated 3,000 Palestinians, 1,000 Israelis, and even 64 foreigners. People on both sides of the 67 lines often refer to that second intifada as the death of the peace process. So I'll state my uncomfortable reality on this particular conflict right up front, and may be apparent to many of you. That conflict today is at an almost historic low. Near to medium-term prospects for progress on virtually any front are also virtually nil. Many difficult decisions lie ahead for both sides, but real progress will not be possible until there is courageous leadership and profound attitudinal changes among both populations. In the words of Thomas Paine, Tom, uh, time makes more converts than reason, and time is what this conflict is now left with. And that's unfortunate, because with time, this conflict only becomes more difficult to solve. I offer this bleak assessment because neither the leaderships of the respective sides nor their publics exhibit either confidence in or hope for a solution. And there's no trust on either side. Now, recent polls bear me out. Public attitudes on both sides have never been more disparaging. In a series of 25 polls dating back to 2009, an average of almost 60% of Palestinians believes that Israel's aspirations are to extend the borders of the state of Israel from the Jordan to the Mediterranean and expel all Arabs. A 2011 survey found that 72% of Palestinians believe it morally right to deny that Jews have a history in Jerusalem extending back for thousands of years, yet 90% of them said it's morally wrong to deny that Palestinians have a history in Jerusalem extending back thousands of years. And even if a two-state solution is negotiated, almost 60% of West Bankers and 65% of Gazans support continuing the struggle until all historic Palestine is liberated, and for armed resistance as a means toward that end. 75% of Palestinians believe chances for a two-state solution to be slim or actually non-existent. And also important, barely a third of Palestinians are satisfied with the leadership of their president, Mahmoud Abbas, also known as Abu Mazen. And those discouraging figures are mirrored on the Israeli side. In a poll conducted just last August, 60%, 67% of Israeli respondents said they did not believe that negotiations between Israel and the Palestinians would produce peace in the near future. Over 80% of Israelis, and it's even higher for Jewish Israelis, doubted a two-state solution will be implemented within the next 10 years. 60% of Israelis don't even believe their own prime minister is committed to a two-state solution. And just last June, only a slight majority of Israelis, 51%, favored a two-state solution. That's down from 62% in the previous year. And three-quarters of Israelis oppose a Palestinian state along the 67 borders. For their parts, Mr. Netanyahu and Abbas have also expressed doubts about prospects for peace. Netanyahu claims that Israel has no partner and that the Palestinians as a whole are not prepared to recognize or accept the permanence of the Jewish state. Abu Mazen, echoing Palestinian sentiments across the board, claims his Israeli counterpart will never accept a Palestinian state. Today, neither the leaderships nor the respective political climates will allow a resolution of this climate. 
Critical ingredients for restarting negotiations with any reasonable chance of success are first, leadership on both sides with the courage to challenge prevailing public opinions and the will to take the attendant very high risks. And secondly, Palestinian and Israeli populations prepared to undertake fundamental attitudinal changes. Now, none of this means that we should throw up our hands and do nothing. Actions can be taken on both sides to begin the long process of changing minds, increasing confidence and hope, and improving the conditions, particularly economic and human conditions, of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Now, the fourth problematic I want to address is a little bit closer to home for Americans, and that is our relationship with Saudi Arabia. Since 1945, the United States and Saudi Arabia have enjoyed a special relationship, not like Israel, but nevertheless quite special. That's when President Roosevelt, by the way, met with King Abdulaziz Saud, uh, also known as Ibn Saud, and the founder of the modern state of Saudi Arabia, on board a U.S. naval vessel in the Red Sea during the waning days of World War II. And since then, the United States have provided strategic defense for the kingdom, that's meant weapon sales, training, and even occasional deployment of U.S. forces there during times of trouble. Also, through the early 1980s, the U.S. played an indispensable and rather very significant role in Saudi Arabia's development. Many of Saudi Arabia's ministries, certainly Saudi Aramco, owe themselves to the many Americans who came to Saudi Arabia to help them with their development. And tens of thousands of Saudi students have studied here in the United States. All this, by the way, for those American taxpayers in the room, you'd be happy to hear, is paid for by Saudi Arabia. In return, the U.S. got priority access to the king's vast, kingdom's vast oil resources, including early on exclusive rights for U.S. oil companies. But most important, as a result of this, Saudi Arabia's status as the world's sole swing producer of oil, that means it can fluctuate its production without much impact on its finances, the kingdom agreed to help keep stable oil and gas prices. And stable oil prices meant stability and predictability in the global economy, which has always been a priority for the United States since World War II. And additionally, the Saudis were staunch anti-communists during the Cold War and belatedly became supporters and allies in war on terrorism. It's been a remarkable relationship. Until very recently, the Saudis had direct access to the president and to senior officials in the White House, usually bypassed the State Department. In fact, they bypassed us a lot. Uh, but the senior U.S. officials were pretty much given the same access. When I was chargé in Riyadh, I had multiple audiences with Karim Prince Abdullah, who was the acting regent at the time because of the in incapacity of King Fahad. Uh, no other foreign diplomat was given that kind of treatment. And visiting senior American officials were always given audiences with either the Crown Prince at the time or Saudi kings. And even after 9-11, the special communication protocols remained largely in place, despite the deterioration in the relationship. One of the many casualties of that day was a serious decline in that hither hitherto strong relationship, but I think persistent efforts by American and Saudi diplomats succeeded in placing that relationship back on strong footing by 2006, 2007. So why is this relationship so unique and so uniquely difficult for both countries? And why does it make Americans, and Saudis too, by the way, so uncomfortable? Well, this has always been a partnership based on shared interests, not on shared values. No two countries could be more unlike in many of their most cherished values. Our cultures, our governmental systems, laws, and approaches to governance and human rights and civil rights are often diametrically opposed. What America and Saudi Arabia share, however, have been core interests in security and stability in the Gulf region and stability in the global economic system. 
It's because of those common interests and the unique roles that each country plays in the region and the world that we have this partnership. But that partnership is strained today, in part because of those differences in our values, but also perceptions of the interests we thought we shared. For example, the United States has developed, I hesitate to use the word relationship, but we certainly are involved more significantly with Iran than we have been for more than 35 years. It was because of the growing fears of a nuclearized Islamic Republic, which the U.S. would have had to confront militarily, that the United States agreed to enter in and eventually conclude an agreement with Iran. And that agreement, of course, will prohibit Iran's nuclear weapons development for the next 15 years. Now, this fed into the sort of Sunni-Shia clash, which exists very prominently in Saudi Arabia. With its Wahhabi Sunni roots, roots, Saudi Arabia simply cannot abide by Shia-dominant Iran. Its the theocratic leadership presents, in the view of the Saudis, a clear and present danger not just to Saudi Arabia, but to Islam. And the kingdom, as the custodian of the two holy places, and that's an official title, must confront what it sees as the Islamic Republic's ambitious plans throughout the region. In Yemen, Bahrain, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and even inside the kingdom itself, conventional Wahhabism holds Shia to be rafida, rejectors, and in some cases even apostates. So this added dimension to their conflict, religious dimension, is going to be extremely difficult. There is also a blurring vision of regional security between the United States and Saudi Arabia. The U.S. saw the Iran Agreement as a necessary and successful diplomatic achievement lending greater security to the region. The Saudis viewed it as a rejection of the historic strong relationship they had had with us. Other U.S. decisions rattled the Saudis. The tepid response to Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen, our failure to step up early in the Syrian civil war to support opposition groups and to deliver on the president's promised red line after Assad used chemical weapons in Syria, and our perceived abandonment of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. These further cemented the idea that the United States and the kingdom no longer share the same vision of security in the Gulf and in the Middle East. And the Saudi leadership also began to question the reliability of the United States. And finally, unless a less spoken concern of the Saudis is America's growing energy independence. Given the technological advances in the oil and gas sector in our country, America relies much less on imported oil. According to the Energy Information Agency, in 2014, about 27 percent of our, of our petroleum was imported. That was the lowest in 30 years. And we all expect that to fall even further. So how much will America need Saudi Arabia when we no longer need its oil? So given all this, we're left to wonder whether the U.S. and the Saudi Arabia truly need one another today. And the uncomfortable answer that I offer is that in spite of our systemic differences and our current policy disputes, we both continue to need one another. We do so because both still share those critical core interests. Saudi Arabia needs our security assurances as much today as ever. And no one, not China, not Russia, not the EU, can do what the United States can do. As the ideological and geographic center of Islam, Saudi Arabia can help us in the generational struggle against extremist Islam. As long as the world remains dependent on oil for the majority of its energy needs, then we have to be count on Saudi Arabia to help maintain price stability in the global markets. And the U.S. will have to find a way to convince the Saudi leadership, and by extension its religious establishment, to moderate the Wahhabi message. This will require a very special kind of diplomacy and special leaderships in both the U.S. and the Kingdom. And finally, America must continue to engage quietly but firmly 
and apply soft pressure in a way that encourages greater respect for human and civil rights in Saudi Arabia, tolerance for other faiths, and ultimately greater openness in the kingdom. And we can only achieve those if we have this very strong and close relationship. And then finally, from this very problematic relationship on one side of the Persian Gulf, or the Arab Gulf, depending on which side of it you happen to live on, uh, I want to move to my last and perhaps even most challenging issue, and that's, of course, Iran. After 36 years of hostile estrangement, the United States, along with the other permanent members of the UN Security Council, plus Germany and the EU, struck that landmark agreement that effectively reduces Iran's ability to produce a nuclear weapon for 15 years. Now, the agreement has its flaws. Namely, it doesn't eliminate entirely Iran's ability to produce such weapons in the distant future. Nevertheless, doubters have been quieted for now. The International Atomic Ener a uh, Energy Agency verified last month that Iran had shipped over eight and a half tons of its enriched uranium out of Iran. So no bomb-making material anymore. It's also disabled more than 12,000 centrifuges and poured concrete into the core of the Iraq reactor which had been producing, or which was designed to produce plutonium. So the agreement must be con considered at least, at the very least, a near to medium term success. It has significantly lowered the likelihood of major military confrontation between Iran and the United States. And that allows time for more diplomacy with Iran to further moderate that country's still virulently hostile attitude and policies toward the US specifically Israel, and the West in general. However, there's nothing specific in the agreement that brings about change in Iran. So our hopes for positive change inside Iran must be tempered by a number of very disturbing policies, practices, and institutions within that country. I'll mention just a handful of these. It continues a very strong support. In fact, it's a national security priority for Hezbollah in Lebanon and for four very large, very significant terrorist groups in Iraq and dozens of others in Iraq. And by the way, those four um, have American blood on their hands from our time there. Uh, also in Iraq, they, support the, the, they supported the formation of Shia militias known as the Hashid al-Shabi or popular mobilization, which give every indication of becoming in Iraq what Hezbollah has become in Lebanon, a government within a government with its own army. The top leaders within the Islamic Republic continue to utter threatening and highly degrading statements against Israel. Iran, of course, is the principal supporter for the regime of Bashar al-Assad, even lending troops uh, in the defense of Syria. Iran lends both material as well as ideological and political support for the Houthis in Yemen. And it possesses one of the world's most atrocious human rights records. It continues to develop and test its ballistic missiles, which are not covered by the agreement. And probably most disturbing for Americans, its supreme leader, Grand Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, regularly rails against the United States. His generals in the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps echo his visceral inflammatory remarks, professing anti-Americanism and continually presenting America as the strategic enemy of Iran have become pillars of Iran's foreign and national security policies. So with these in mind, one's left to wonder, how will Iran behave with international sanctions lifted? And can Iran and the United States truly develop a new relationship? But the difficult and inevitable reality is that the United States and Iran must find a way to get along and indeed forge a new, less hostile relationship. Failure will only lead to greater likelihood of conflict, continued instability in the region, and stunted development in Iran. President Obama and Secretary Kerry have taken significant steps toward improving this relationship, but their successors will have to ensure Iran follows the spirit and the word of the agreement and never possess a nuclear weapon. They must also find a way to get Iran to address all the other issues that confound relations between our two countries. 
that is the superpower and the now preeminent regional power. And of course, we have to find a way to avoid conflict. The second related uncomfortable reality is that improvement in the relationship will require extraordinary, even uncommon, diplomacy and leadership. The United States will have to balance clarity and firmness on certain outstanding critical issues with statesmanship in seeking a new path forward. Iran's leaders and its people face an even greater challenge, choosing between the path of revolutionary zeal, which will keep them isolated and less developed than they could, or charting a new path toward reintegration with the international community. So that's my rather distressing assessment of the region's greatest challenges. Uh, there are a few more that I could have mentioned uh, when I started working on my remarks here. I mentioned this to my wife, and she said, you only found five? <laughs> um, but I don't want to necessarily end it on such a, a downbeat note. I, I will say that having lived and worked in this region, most of the people there are acutely aware of the problems they face. And they desperately want to see changes. And they're struggling to affect those changes. They're facing the challenges that I've just discussed. Uh, but I, also, but I, I do believe sincerely that they're going to find these changes. But it will be, as I said, after a generational struggle. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gary. Um, your talk was titled Five Uncomfortable Facts About the Middle East. I counted about 25. Um, but I think the, the broader point here is that the region is um, in deep turmoil, and there's no um, light on the horizon um, that one could really point to, which um, raises the question, you know, what can the United States be doing and what should the United States be doing with respect to the unfolding destabilization uh, of the Middle East. So but before I turn the floor over to the audience, let me just try and um, pin you down on one particular conflict that I think uh, at this moment is really at the heart of much of the destabilization in the Middle East and, and which directly affects U.S. national interests, and that's, of course, um, the conflict in Syria. Um, President Obama has basically been content to sort of um, look at Syria through the prism of Iraq. Um, viewing any sort of deeper engagement there as a slippery slope to uh, another possible foreign policy disaster, effectively turning over the conflict to Russia and Iran to s many ways set the rules of the game while sort of tacitly sort of supporting our allies in the region. Um, the next president is going to confront Syria. We don't know where Syria will be uh, a year from now. Um, but I suspect it's still going to be at the uh, forefront of the international community's attention. So the question for you is, um, what um, could the United States be doing? What should the United States be doing now to help ameliorate that conflict, which is sort of destabilizing not only the Middle East, but as we can now see in Europe and as a result of ISIS, um, affecting our national security interests as well? I should... Start up my response by uh, saying that uh, certainly having been a diplomat in, in the Middle East, I'm well aware of all the challenges there. I used to tell people that hope to an American diplomat was like courage to a soldier. Um, you're just not effective working in the Middle East if you don't have hope. Um, with with re respect to this most distressing conflict now taking place in, uh, in Syria, uh, I personally believe that we've made mistakes and we need to recognize those mistakes. We're now moving into an extremely difficult period because um, we've lost the initiative. We had it early on. I think it was right for the president to declare that Assad must go, and we should never let go of that. He needs to go, and his regime needs to go. But we have to be careful in how that happens. Um, I, uh, I wrote a piece a while back where I suggested that perhaps maybe we ought to just set that aside just for a moment which is very distressing for many opposition groups, particularly the moderate opposition, to hear. But turn to the moderate opposition. By the way, there are about 70,000, mostly Syrians, fighting for the moderate opposition. That's opposed to roughly 30,000 who are fighting with ISIS right now. 
and well over half of those 30,000 are foreign fighters. And I don't know a single conflict where foreign fighters have been able, have been able to overcome a significant domestic force. So how do we redirect this oppos moderate opposition force to take on the very real challenge of ISIS that is faced not only by Syria, but also by neighboring Iraq. And by the way, of course, as Nader just mentioned, its tentacles have reached most certainly to Lebanon, Turkey, and Jordan, neighboring countries, uh, but even into Europe. How about if we told these moderate opposition, and by the way, there's a political counterpart to that, some in the country, most out of the country, um, if you retake the so-called lands of ISIS, we'll recognize you as Syria and withdraw recognition from Damascus. Uh, I would hope that would be a significant motivator and then provide them with the wherewithal to achieve that objective. Uh, that's one suggestion that I've had. I think one of the other things that we have to do is step up the, the support that we're giving Iraq. Um, we've seen some progress in Iraq's uh, uh, conflict with ISIS, particularly with the retaking of the um, town of Ramadi, which is not that far from Baghdad, by the way, um, less than 50 miles. Um, and now they're confronted with a nearby town of Fallujah, which is well known to many American Marines and soldiers. And then, of course, with uh, a major challenge uh, in, lar in Iraq's largest city of Mosul. Iraq is going to continue to need significant help from the United States in terms of both weapons and training, uh, probably more extensive training that we gave Iraq even during the occupation period. Um, I also want to draw a line here. Uh, you, I think any this administration has certainly recognized it, and I think any future administration will also have to recognize that Americans are not prepared to send huge numbers of American troops back to the Middle East, not after the conflicts that we've been involved in for now, what, a dozen years. Um, we may have to send more troops back, but I think there is still opportunity to be had in working with the forces that are there, that are allied with us. We've heard, for example, that Saudi Arabia and the Emirates are prepared to send forces to fight ISIS. Um, I have my doubts about that. Uh, I'd like to see it, and I suspect that there are strings attached, all kinds of strings. Namely, what are you, the Americans, going to be doing if we decide to send our troops there? Uh, but I think we have to face the fact that um, the country is no longer in the mood for sending large numbers of troops back there, and we'll have to, be, we'll have to work with um, the forces uh, that are there and to give them the wherewithal to, um, to deal with these conflicts. Please stay there, and we'll take some questions. The floor is open. Yes, sir. Ambassador, uh, you made the point that we need to continue, the U.S. needs to continue to have a productive relationship with Saudi Arabia. Then he moved on to Iran and made the point that we need to do something to make that a productive relationship. But it seems that having a relationship with both the Saudis and, and, and the Iranians are mutually exclusive kind of things. Um. From our, from our perspective, of course, they aren't. Um, and I don't think the Iranians would expect us to distance ourselves from Saudi Arabia. Um, I, I just don't think they would. I mean, they have their problems uh, with Saudi Arabia, to be sure, but not to the extent that Saudi Arabia has with them. Um, I, I just can't understate um, how strongly many Saudis feel when it comes to this issue of Sunnis versus Shia. It's pretty profound. Um, and I heard it from the most senior levels, and uh, I heard it from everyday Saudis. Now, I'm not saying this is, applies to all Saudis, uh, but it is an issue. Mm -hmm. And the whole issue of Wahhabism, I think, and Saudis reluctantly have come around to accepting that, that uh, the Islamic extremism that we're seeing in the world today found its ideological source in Wahhabism. Uh, so that's going to be really a tough 
problem for the Saudis and for the United States, but I don't necessarily see the, the two relationships as being exclusive. And creative diplomacy is going to have to find a way to square that. Um, fortunately, both countries recognize the value of a strong relationship, if for no other reason, economics with the United States. Uh, certainly, everyday Iranians know that, and the Saudis know that, uh, and uh, I think new leadership and concerted diplomacy, we can overcome this over time. But they're not mutually exclusive. Okay, the floor is open. Yes. I want to thank you for a very, very interesting talk, lots of food for thought. And uh, I want to come back to your uh, points about what would be needed for new directions in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You said that there were two critical ingredients for restarting. First was leadership on both sides willing to challenge public opinion, and the other was Israeli and Palestinian populations willing to undertake fundamental attitude change. So on the first point, I'm wondering, uh, for political leadership uh, to challenge public opinion, I presume there needs to be some sort of significant minority opinion uh, still operating that can support public leaders that are willing to take a different stance. So I'm curious if there are those kinds of <coughs> voices that you have identified that might make it possible for leaders to take on other uh, approaches. And then on the attitudinal change front, one of the challenges with attitudes is that parties are typically in echo chamber boxes that don't allow for the changing of attitudes, that you either need to have the modeling of new attitudes or you need to have behavioral changes that contradict those attitudes that then compel you to change your attitudes. But if we have populations that are effectively segregated, how can that possibly happen? First of all, the, the situation that we see today in terms of um, the um, disparaging attitudes of both Israelis and Palestinians, that hasn't always been there. During the 1990s and early 2000s, significant percentages of both Israelis and Palestinians not only wanted a solution, but actually expected one to come fairly soon. Uh, and that's why I say with uh, the right kind of leadership, uh, those attitudes can begin to change. I honestly believe that most Israelis and indeed most Palestinians do want to see an end to this conflict. We can argue about how they see it ending. Um, changing the attitudes obviously uh, is going to be extremely difficult and that's why I thought it would take generations. And one of the responsibilities that I had working at the State Department was um, working with European countries to help rewrite some of the Palestinian textbooks, to have some of the um, inciting language removed. And this was extremely difficult um, because that language was present in books even at the elementary school. Kids were doing arithmetic using Kalashnikovs um, and even worse. Uh, so changing attitudes is going to be a more profound change and that's why I think it's going to take uh, generations. I, um, during my time in Jerusalem working with Tony Blair, I became very discouraged, particularly uh, from what I heard on the Palestinian side, and particularly among Palestinian leaders. I just felt that their time had passed, that they were, they sort of, they had been this revolutionary group that had essentially co-opted public attitudes. Um, and these attitudes had become almost a prisoner of these very arcane leadership attitudes. And that leadership among the Palestinians is going to have to go. And I'm not just speaking of Hamas. That's clear and definite. But even of Fatah. I mean, these two organizations, political parties, have, iron grips, uh, have an iron grip on the political system in uh, the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, and I really think young Palestinians want to break out of that. They truly do. You go to university campuses, which I did in the West Bank. You talk to young Palestinians. They're very emotional. But when you start talking to them, they know they don't have the right kind of leadership that can lead them as an independent state, even though they may want that state right now, today. So those attitudinal changes 
I think are happening. Um, there just needs to be the leadership, the right kind of leadership on both sides to tap into it. I really believe it exists on the Israeli side. Uh, and, and, and I also believe it exists on the Palestinian side. But it's going to be extremely difficult. Uh, I mean, I keep using that word, kind of run out of synonyms for challenging, difficult, hard, really damn hard. <laughs> Give up all hope. But no, um, um, uh, there are possibilities. And there is certainly goodwill on the part of the international community. The United States, I mean, I give John Kerry credit, even though, quite honestly, it was a fool's errand. It wasn't going to work. When he, start, he restarted negotiations in 2013, lasted about 13 months, failed in the spring of 2014. As I said, the climate wasn't there and the leadership wasn't right. But I give him credit. The United States is committed to this. I've worked a lot with our European friends. They care deeply about this. So the international community is ready to work with both sides. Yes, thank you very much for your talk, uh, Ambassador. I uh, appreciate very much the, the final effort to sort of trying to see some hope amidst darkness in your talk. I know there's not much light here. Uh, it seems to me that when we talk about United States foreign policy, and you take us back since 1956, there has never been a foreign policy in the United States that really was animated by um, human rights concerns. Uh, it was always geopolitical or economic interests, as you were suggesting, rightly so. And so most people in the Arab world know, know that about the United States. And they know that there is, you know, unless there is oil interest or less stability between Jordan, uh, Egypt, and, and Israel, there's not much more going on for them as people. And so they revert as a result of that the sectarian uh, fallback that you refer to. I was wondering, in sort of the, the way you approach the second part, perhaps another talk, or perhaps the beginning of another talk in, in this conversation, uh, the focus on civil society. You mentioned Thomas Paine, who had thinking. Thomas Paine was not only a revolutionary agitator in the United States, but also <laughs> in Europe, and had at heart how to move forward um, civil society. Uh, so there are conversations going on in the Arab Middle East that the United States is not even paying attention and it's beneath the radar of U.S. foreign policy. So even uh, just by exa for example, you were talking about the Israeli-Palestinian question. So we know that even from the Israeli president rivaling to the far left, to the far right, one can call them far right, but left, uh, there's been conversation about a short of a two-state solution, expansions of civil and political right, even in the West Bank as it exists. And it's quite predominant, this conversation. So it's not just an attitudinal change, but those conversations out there. Um, there are lack of conversations in US foreign policy circles about how to improve the very early stages of the Arab uprising that was animated by secular liberal and secular forces. How is the United States, if, if you were invited to be part of the next administration uh, and, and, and sent in the Middle East, how would you think that the United States should sort of galvanize uh, this uh, effort about human rights uh, in beyond just the, the simple um, equation, the simple formula of let's focus on leadership, which has been out over the right leadership, or just institutions that will come along, but rather how can we re revamp or refocus the United States foreign policy that will sort of bring sort of a more a down approach, a sort of a civil society approach that will sort of succeeding from what perspective. Well, you're certainly correct. Until about 1976 or so, human rights was, was never a factor in, in, in U.S. policy in, in the region. Uh, President Jimmy Carter changed that. Um, and, and it did become um, an element of U.S. policy. And, and, um, and uh, the, um, the session we had last week I told someone the most difficult sessions I ever had with the Saudis were not about fighting terrorists. They're about human rights, whether it was women, religious minorities, freedom of the press. They were tough, very hard. They were quiet. They were private. We didn't go out in public because you don't get the Saudis or frankly any other, frankly any other government in the Middle East to change their human rights policy by publicly embarrassing them. That's my personal view. 
Some of the worst, yes, Saddam and it, Assad and others, most definitely. Um, if you read uh, the human rights reports, also the human trafficking reports that the State Department puts out every year, they're pretty critical of our best friends, Saudi Arabia, even Israel, and its treatment of Palestinians. Um, one of the, I hate to use the word fortunate, um, outcomes of the WikiLeaks, I call it a scandal because all of a sudden all of our private communications that we diplomats had had with our counterparts was out in the public. But if you read those, over years, even decades, the United States had conversations with President Mubarak about liberalizing his country. The man had 30 years to do it. Opening up his media, providing for free speech, allowing civil society institutions. By the way, we were trying to fund a lot of those civil society institutions through USAID in Egypt. Um, allowing civil society institutions to form. More religious tolerance. Even opening up elections. He resisted. And the WikiLeaks cables that came out confirm all that. I was somewhat relieved because now the world could see that no, the United States is not silent on human rights. We talk a lot about it. We talk about it, frankly, more than any other country to both our friends and even our enemies when we talk to them. Uh, I was involved in a, in a program shortly after 9-11. Uh, in fact, I helped start it called the Middle East Partnership Initiative. And this was focused on America's soft power, where, in fact, we can be just as effective as we can on our hard power using our military, our intelligence. We started funding organizations devoted to enhancing the role of women, or educational reform, or economic reform, and even political reform. And by the way, I got stiffed and shown the door many, many times in trying to advocate for these programs. Today, by the way, this program is embraced throughout the Middle East. It's now spent uh, over half a billion dollars addressing these problems because these are now core parts of our foreign policy. Now, I will say that at the end of the day, when a president has to make a decision, he, or perhaps in the future she, will always look at our core national interests. That's the way policy is done. Human rights will be a factor, but we have other interests, our own security, our own economic prosperity, and it's a difficult decision whether you're the president, whether you're the secretary of state, or an ambassador, or just a diplomat serving in, in the field, you have to make that balance, find that balance, and find a way to approach that government. Um, but I think the United States in recent years has done a commendable job. There's more we can do, of course, uh, especially when you, when you look at the problems that I referred to at the outset of my remarks, these human condition. This is where they really need our help. They really need our help, helping develop institutions, helping, expo helping to expose them to the ideologies they're going to need to form the institutions that can tackle these problems. When I talked about democracy in the Middle East, I first thing I would ask Arabs is, tell me what an Arab democracy will look like. And don't mention America, or Great Britain, or Japan, or anybody else. Tell me what your democracy would look like. And they don't have a clear answer because it's a unique culture with a history that extends back far further than ours. And so how do you de devise a democracy that reflects that culture, their religion, and their history, but is recognized by all of us in this room and by them as a democracy? Let's take one more question um, at the back, and then we will end it. Thanks. Um, thank you, Ambassador. I'm wondering, um, in, in your human rights, why the United States continues to veto all of the human rights violation, violations charges against Israel, consistently over a period of 40 years or something like that. I think it gives the U.S. a serious black eye. Well, it certainly gives us a black eye among Arabs. Um, but in fact, I mean, look, 
I'm not going to sit here and praise uh, Israel's human rights record when it comes to treatment of Palestinians or even Arab Israelis. But in fact, personally, having witnessed how human rights are respected or not carried out, Israel is not the problem when it comes to human rights. Uh, and condemning Israel in the UN is a political sideshow. It, it doesn't accomplish anything. Yes, makes us look bad, bad in the eyes of Arabs, because you could, you could have a con an equal condemnation, if not worse, for every single country, uh, Arab, Arab country, and even worse for Iran, and pro way worse for Saudi Arabia. So, like I said, I, I just think it's a political sideshow. It accomplishes nothing. Uh, we can have a very effective and productive conversation and dialogue with Israelis about their human rights record. Uh, far more effective and productive than we can just about any, in fact, for a fact, any other Arab government. So um, I, of all the human rights problems uh, that we face in there, Israel and its treatment of Palestinians certainly being one of them, um, there are far worse problems over there that we should be tackling. But does it invalidate the importance of the U.N.? No, and I think using this in the U.N. Uh, does just the opposite. That's not what the U.N. is for. Uh, by the way, I, I, um, I have to say that, I mean, the U.N. has haltingly condemned Iran's human rights record, and at one point, the U.S. had to withdraw from the previous Human Rights Committee at, at the UN because you had countries like Libya and Iran and China serving on it. Even North Korea wants to get on it. These are the countries with, I mean, truly the bottom of the barrel in terms of human rights. Um, uh, the, the human rights goals of the UN are quite lofty, but the implementation has been pretty shoddy and ineffective. Okay, please join me in thanking Ambassador Grappler.